What's up, Bruin Bible listeners? This is your host, Will Decker. I uh, wanted to reach out and say thank you guys for all the listens, all the love. We see it on social media. We see it on YouTube. It has been sensational. And we want to encourage you guys, if you guys are enjoying the podcast and liking it, that you guys subscribe and like it, uh, whether it's on YouTube, on our UCLA LAFB channel, or the Bruin Bible, uh, to subscribe either through Spotify, Apple Podcasts, however you guys listen and react to it because it's going to allow us to do much greater things in the future. We're creators. We want to be giving the best Bruins content to all of our UCLA listeners. The only way we can do that is if we have a fan base that is locked in and helping us out. So we appreciate you guys. We love you guys. If you guys have been liking it, please help us out with a like and subscribe. What is up Bruin Bible listeners? Happy 2024. First episode of the New Year's uh, for myself, Will Decker, and my co-host, Mr. Jamal Madney, 1090 ESPN Radio, The Mightier. We're excited to kick it off with UCLA football. We're also going to be starting, this is the first episode we're going to be talking about UCLA basketball, and it's going to be a lot of fun talking about it. First and foremost, Madman, talk to me about the holiday season. How was it with you and yours and how did you ring in uh, 2024 this past Well, week? Will, I mean, it's great to, great to see you, my friend. As always, a happy new year to you and all of our listeners. Uh, you know, it was a great holiday season, recharging with, with friends and family, quality time, and, uh, you know, just getting the opportunity to sort of reflect uh, that, that you get to in the holiday season. So really excited about it and uh, really fired up about 24 Thriller. So excited to be doing this with you. And I know you and I got a chance to spend some time in the holidays. We got to go catch a, uh, a UCLA basketball game together and spend some time and, and excited for more uh, in, in 24. A lot more of that, man. So really, really pumped for that. We got some big news yesterday for UCLA football. Ilkaika Malloy uh, was named and promoted to defensive coordinator. He was the defensive line coach and outside linebackers coach. You know, a lot of mixed reactions to the fan base. And I want to say just from a standpoint of keeping in-house, I thought the hire was a home run, you know, given what he was able to achieve last year. We're talking about the team that generated uh, the most pressures in college football last year, according to PFF. And a lot of those, they didn't even get to play their conference championship game. So they still had more than the likes of some of these teams that got extra games, extra benefits in those margins. And, you know, he did such an outstanding job with the likes of your Latus, your Murphy Twins, even your Carl Jones Juniors and some of these other players uh, that he was able to help generate pass rush with. He helped out with Olafemula Dejao. He was a huge part of landing these guys on campus. And I think the biggest indication to me on how successful of a hire this was, was the players' reaction to it. On Twitter, you saw a lot of the players, you know, your Jay Toyas, uh, you know, past pra- players. Yeah, Pitts. Shit. Yeah, yeah, Say Pitts coming out. You know, even some of the contacts that I have with UCLA football, former players, things like that, I've never heard nothing but positive things to say about Malloy. They really like this guy a lot. He helped build a culture in Washington and is replicating that at UCLA. It was one of the most dominant defenses we've had in 30 to 40 years. Give me your initial take on it because I think, you know, I understand maybe wanting to look outside the coaching tree to get somebody else, but I think keeping Malloy on staff – keeps Ken Norton Jr. on staff without overhauling everything else. And I think that's a win in itself. So tell me what you think about it, my man. I thought it was a home run, Will. And I think that continuity, I think, was key on the defensive side of the ball. Because when you have success, you want to be able to replicate that year over year. And when you go are going now into the Big Ten, a thicker trenches Big Ten, you want a defensive coordinator with that right mindset. And what I love about Malloy is, A, it's the continuity of this existing system. B, it's sort of the relationship that he's already built with the staff and current and former players. But C, it's also the rounding of his experience, Will. When you talk about defensive line experience, when you talk about linebacker experience, he has sort of a variety of that front seven experience. And then you go back 
you know, the previous four years when he was at Washington and had D-line experience. He was co-defensive coordinator at the University of Washington, who, oh, by the way, is playing in the national championship game. And he was able to coach and develop the likes of Avita Vea, of a, a, a Greg Gaines. You know, I mean, so these are big time NFL prospects in addition to the studs that he's seen here at UCLA. So I couldn't agree with you more. I think this was absolutely a home run hire. I think sometimes fans get a little bit lost in sort of the sexiness of certain names and and folks that are on the outside. The grass isn't always greener. I think this was a superb hire by UCLA. And again, in kind of keeping in line with that theme of continuity, particularly on the defensive side of the ball as they get into the Big Ten. So this was a terrific hire. And now they can kind of round out the staff and bring in players that fit Malloy's system, which they've already started doing. Yes, man. And we're going to get to that guy in a second. I am so excited about this former top 100 overall recruit uh, committing to UCLA. He's got four years left of eligibility. But just to kind of touch on how good this defense was last year because of Ilkaika Malloy, 10th ranked total defense in the country last year. We had the second best rushing defense in the country. And if anyone that knows anything about the rushing defense, it starts in the trenches. It's closing those gaps and making sure the linebackers are coming. He was directly responsible for that, coaching the outside linebackers and the defensive line. Just a beast. I mean, third in the country in team tackles for a loss. He was generating pressures. And he helped, you know, to be honest with you, like have Latu and the Murphy Twins reach their ceiling, you know, as players to become potential future pros in the NFL. So Okaika Malloy, really good hire. And like we mentioned earlier, man, already getting players of his personnel on campus. We got a huge commitment yesterday, six foot seven, 280 pounds. I, I texted you, can this guy play power forward for us this year? As it's looking a little dry on the basketball court right now, Collins H.E.M. Pionk. And this guy has such a great story. Moved from Ghana in 2019 to Santa Margarita uh, out in Southern California. Picked up football as he thought it might be a way to help out his family across the country. And boy, did he ever do that. He became a top 100 recruit in college football. Eventually committed to Mario Crystal Ball down in Miami. But this guy, I mean, he had offers from LSU, your USC's, your who's who of college football. Ended up going to Miami, wants to come back to Southern California, and UCLA is getting this guy. Four years left of eligibility for a talented edge rusher. And I know the big question a lot of people had was who's going to replace the edges. This is a huge commitment, man. This guy can slide in day one and play maybe next to a Grant Bucky. Maybe you move Olafemi Oladejo down to that other edge spot. But this is as bad as big as a commitment UCLA has gotten on paper in the transfer portal and sometime given how important the defensive line is. Talk to me about your – Initial impressions on Collins at Champion. Yeah, no, Will, I mean, you, you you nailed it. I mean, this is you when you talk about raw athleticism uh, at the edge position, 6'8, 270, Collins at Champong. I mean, what a what a stud. You you mentioned the story, Will, so I won't repeat it. I mean, very inspiring story. But this is sort of that raw athlete that you want in the lab for the likes of a Malloy, for the likes of a, a Ken Norton Jr., for the likes of that defensive staff. And this is a seamless heir apparent to Leatu Latu and the Murphy Twins. And so the fact that Malloy could score such a decorated recruit, you're talking top 100, he was top 30 in the state of California, had his pick of the litter, chose UCLA. It sort of speaks to the stability of that staff and what they're able to generate. And I don't want to take anything away, Will, from DeAnton Lynn because he's been so phenomenal. But the fact of the matter is DeAnton Lynn was only there for one year. And the likes of Malloy and the likes of Ken Norton Jr. have been there several years. So they've also had a lot to do with building the foundation of this defense. And Collins is going to fit right in. And what I love about it is four more years of eligibility. This can really be an anchor for this defense for years to come. And now what this does in terms of a domino effect, when you look at other top recruits, other folks at the edge spot and saying, hey, you've got a stud on one end. Let me come and be that combination and we can sort of get it on both sides of the ball. This was a massive get for UCLA and they're off to a resounding start here in 24. I know the end of the 23 season, you know, there was a lot of different feelings and sentiments, losing players, losing coaches. 
but picking up right at the beginning of 24, getting stability that DC spot, and now getting a Chempong at one edge. I think this is far from being done. I expect another two edges to commit here in the weeks to come here, Will, and really round out that front seven. And I think I want to double click on a point you made earlier and, and have been making for a few weeks now is, you know, is there now an opportunity for Oladijo to also potentially kind of switch roles a little bit and go from that traditional linebacker spot to more of an edge spot? Can you imagine those two athletes, Will, at each of the edges? I mean, you could go anywhere across the country, SEC, Big Ten, anywhere, and not necessarily have two better raw athletes than those two guys at the two edges. So UCLA starting to build a foundation for 24 and beyond. Bruin fans should be rejoicing and celebrating in the streets here with Collins at Champong. And it's just very encouraging because I think you look at the commitments we've gotten in the transfer portal. and What's been one of the common complaints from UCLA fans is the lack of getting recruiting talents uh, over these past few years. You look at Rico Flores, a guy we talked about, you know, offers from Georgia, Ohio State. It doesn't get better than that in college football. You talk about a guy like Ed Champion, man. This guy had offers from LSU, Oregon's, USC. It doesn't get much better than that. So this guy, these guys could have played anywhere in the country and they chose to come to UCLA. That means a lot moving forward with the program. It shows that, you know, maybe not everything is perfect in the program right now. We're building something. We're getting there, right? And, you know, we're not done yet in the transfer portal. Rumor has it we may have another uh, defensive lineman coming. But just for reference, Olafemi Oladejo, man, just so athletic, so athletic in so many ways, six foot three, 250 pounds. He could kind of be that, you know, outside linebacker blitz style, kind of similar to your like Von Miller or something like yep. that. Or maybe he doesn't play all edge, but he can play a hybrid of outside yes. linebacker and edge. And I think we need more of that next year, especially if we're going to be struggling with replicating the numbers that we put up with the lots using the Murphy twins. So I think that would be an awesome idea to move forward and, and i think will the one thing i'll just say there is it doesn't really matter necessarily where you get the talent you know whether it's traditionally from high school or from the transfer portal because the way the game has changed now in terms of the transfer portal and kind of the unregulation guys can jump at any point whether a system doesn't fit personnel doesn't fit they don't like their coaches they don't like their teammates they had a rough year they had injuries what have you and so oftentimes now, when you look look beyond, is the juice worth the squeeze in terms of recruiting guys straight out of high school? Because the probability that they are going to stay with you for two, three, four years now is getting slimmer and slimmer. And so you'd rather sort of pick and choose in a very targeted, strategic way in the transfer portal, guys that A, are more experienced, B, know who they are, have had some battle scars, and C, have a very sort of focused role that they want to come in and fill for your team. So I think at the end of the day, you want to have the best product on the field with the best athletes and the best players that fit your system. Whether that comes from high school or whether that comes from the transfer portal now should be very agnostic. And there's a lot to be said for the value proposition of how coaches spend their time recruiting, that that value is probably better spent on transfers because you're getting more focused, mature guys. Yeah, and I, you know, all we've been hearing is that there's going to be a drop off in the transfer portal from UCLA thus far, and you know, I think we still have a long way to go in addressing all of our total team needs. Specifically, I want to see the offensive line make some absolutely the last year. But I mean, you look at the caliber of players we're getting in there. Marcus Radcliffe coming from San Diego State. This guy had multiple SEC offers to transfer, including a team that I have as legitimate national title contenders in Ole Miss next year with Lane Kiffin yes. in Texas A&M. And then Addison, I mean, this guy has, you know, double-digit starts for Oregon University. So, I mean, you get these guys, the kicker from Cal coming down, which we sorely needed after last year's special team. He's before. a stud, too, Will. Yeah. I mean, you want to talk about massive upgrade in the kicking game. You know, uh, Bagani from Cal, he's going to set kind of some UCLA records on fire next year. Yeah, man. And it's just, it just kind of goes back to the point we previously discussed. Yes, NIL money means a lot. It does that's the world we live in nowadays, and I want players to be able to provide for their families in situations and things like that. But the opportunity to play and develop, I think, is almost just as valuable, if not more, than that if you want to have a career in football long term. And I think players are seeing that as well, which is why UCLA has been able to land some top-notch talent there. Do you think that's a fair statement, given the current world of NIL? Absolutely, Will. And I think it's a supply and demand situation, because you're seeing certain schools – 
when they're going some of the the top end schools going and recruiting seven deep, eight deep at a particular position. Guess what? No one's going to stay, uh, you know, sitting sixth or seventh or eighth on the depth chart. They're going to look at all of their options because they want to be able to play. And so obviously nil is very attractive and the opportunity to kind of set yourself up financially is huge. And that is sort of priority one for many of these players. But sometimes, and this is part of the selling point, even if you get a little bit less nil up front, the opportunity to play then sets yourself up for even more financial success long term. It's area under the curve. It's the long game. If I if I'm making eight hundred fifty thousand or a million or a million five that some of these kids are getting out of high school, but I'm riding the bench versus maybe getting two hundred or three hundred thousand, but I'm getting the opportunity to play. I'm putting some exceptional film together. I'm putting a package together that's very attractive at the next level, now I get set up for that NFL contract and set myself up for a great career. And oh, by the way, I get to do that at a place like UCLA, the number one public university in the country with such terrific facilities, beautiful campus, beautiful academics, terrific alumni base. So there's an incredible selling point here for UCLA where in many ways, the supply chain of talent, you almost start using the top football programs as your suppliers of talent rather than having to go get the talent in high school use them as your supply chain because they're not going to be able to keep all six or seven guys at a particular position yeah it's completely fair and as we transition to basketball for the first time it's fun to just even say that I've always been taken by a quote that Charles Barkley had when talking about college athletes and deciding where to go he essentially was like you're going to get benefits this was even before the pay-to-play model had come out. If you're good enough, people are going to find you, and they're going to you know, essentially slide something on the table for you. But go someplace you're going to play, that you're going to develop. That is how you get good at your skills and craft. It allows you to go forward. I mean, I'm a 49ers fan, right? Ooh, ooh, Brock Purdy went to Alabama. He was offered by Alabama, but he chose to go to Iowa State, yes. a place where he could play. He would not be prepared to be playing right now. He would have maybe one or a half season of starting as opposed to four solid years of reps, learning, getting better, on-field experience that cannot be replicated if you're trying to take your game to the highest level. So that is huge moving forward. Madman, we're, we're talking about basketball. This is as cool as it gets. Very excited to dive in to the world of college basketball. What I'm not excited to dive in about is how bad <laughs> UCLA has been on the hardwood this year. It's been tough so far, man. And, you know, some of these losses, as we're going through it, man, They've been in these games, you know, you know, even last night, they start off the game on a 10 0 run. You think, Hey man, we're finally going to get together. We're going to be two and one in pac 12 play did not go that way. 59 53, but even dating back to the beginning of the season, you play a number four Marquette at that time. You lose by two points. I mean, you play against Gonzaga, you lose by four. You're right in within striking distance. It's not like you're getting blown out in these games. Ohio state, you lose by single digits Villanova. You lose by single digits. It's just been a tough, tough go of it. And then I stayed up and watched, the, you know, the Oregon game on almost New Year's Eve a couple of days ago, losing by five on the road to a talented Dana Altman team. You know, it, it's been very, very hit or miss, very clunky. You know, I think they're sorely missing the floor general that Tiger Campbell was, you know, the last four years. A lot of missing pieces on this team. There's only really three guys I feel confident about. We could really dive into that if you want to. But it's just been kind of a nightmare start to the season from UCLA. Give me your initial thoughts on the season thus far, Madman, and what would be your way of fixing what we have seen thus far from Mick Cronin's bunch in Westwood? Yeah, well, I mean, first of all, just so exciting to be be able to to talk basketball. I know it's it's a first love for both you and me. And I also want to point out in in a moment of levity here for for our viewers that the moment we decided that we were going to do basketball together this this year. <laughs> You know, UCLA had a 29-game winning streak at home. And you and I went to the CSUN game as our first game together. We lost that game. Will, I want to just point out, since we have decided to do basketball, we've gone from a 29-game winning streak at home to a three-game losing streak at home. So, you know, it's uh, it's been quite the inflection point. But this has been a really interesting season, Will. I mean, obviously, a, a rebuilding season in, in every sense of the word. When you lose guys like... Jaime Jaquez Jr., and you lose Tiger Campbell, and you lose Amari Bailey, and you lose uh, Clark. Clark. I mean, it's it's just such a huge 
uh, group there to lose. You're talking about you're losing your top four players, seven of your top 10 scorers. So this was always going to be a rebuilding situation. I think where I see challenges for this particular season, first point, Will, you hit it on the head. They just don't have a true point guard. And that that Tiger Campbell role is really missing. I think Dylan Andrews is playing uh, point guard very valiantly, but his game is a little bit more two guard. He's a guy who likes to sort of, you know, create two, three bounces off the dribble, get into that mid range, that elbow area, that free throw area, and really be able to create uh, offense for himself. Dylan Andrews really is in kind of an ideal sixth, seventh, eighth man on a championship team, someone who's going to come off the bench and provide a lot of scoring stability. So po- lack of point guard play is really showing up here in terms of their inability to create any sort of identity or flow offensively and have a plan in the half court. Second, Will, I think, is shooting. And shooting has been glaring with this team all year. This is a team now we're 14 games into the season. They're shooting 42% from the field. They're shooting 29% from three as a team. And so what we're seeing now is teams really sort of packing it in and really playing zone, clogging the middle. Because one of the strengths of this team is the interior play of a Dambona as well as a Burke. And they've got kind of a twin tower situation. Burke, 6'9", 245 from Turkey. A Dambona, of course, 6'11", 7 feet. And so there's an opportunity to get some points in the paint. But teams are now starting to sort of pack it in. And they're basically daring Andrews, Lazar Stefanovic, and Sebastian Mack to sort of beat them from the perimeter. And I think Sebastian Mack is a terrific player, but he's more of a slasher. He's more of a guy who wants to kind of get to the cup. He reminds me of a very young Dwayne Wade, a Dion Waiters type of player, really wants to get to the cup. He's not really a shoot first type of guy. He's a drive first type of player. And then I think with Lazar Stefanovic, there was really a hope that he was going to be that knockdown shooter and his inability to hit shots has really crippled this team from an offensive standpoint. And then when you look sort of off the bench, Will McClendon has provided sparks. um, And then you've got Brandon Williams off the bench, who's also sort of provided sparks in a situation. So for me, Will, I think what you have to do moving forward is I like what Mick Cronin has done bringing in Burke with a Dembona and kind of creating this twin tower situation. I think they can do more there. Um, but I think they're going to have to figure out what they want to do in terms of the three guard lineup. And I think there's sort of two versions here where you can play Burke and Bona and figure out who your three wing players are or a situation where I think they may need to go is kind of play a three guard lineup with Mac, with McClendon, with Andrews, keep Bona, bring Burke off the bench to kind of sort of replace Bona, bring, bring, uh, you know, sort of. Uh, Burke and Brandon Williams off the bench and play V-Day and and almost do sort of a point forward situation. Because if you can't sort of generate offense traditionally through the point guard, can you do it through sort of a point forward situation? And then you're spreading the court a little bit more. But they've got to find a way to sort of spread the court a little bit more and be able to make shots. And the one thing I'll say, Will, is as tough as this season has been, Mick Cronin has been unbelievably entertaining in some of these post-game press conferences. I mean, from some of the things that he said a couple nights ago with, you know, that rang alarm bells in terms of nil, where he said, look, we always look to improve our roster. It's just like in baseball where the Reds try and get players, but the Dodgers buy them. I mean, that was sort of alarm bells of UCLA needing to up their nil game in basketball. And then last night where he talked so much about aptitude of the team. And he said, you know, as a teacher, you're really counting on aptitude. And he's he's basically sort of challenging their ability to sort of absorb plays, absorb information. And they're still really young in their ability to do so. And was very candid about this team kind of inventing new ways to turn over the basketball. So I think what Cronin's really looking for is protect the basketball, have sort of an identity on offense, even if you're not making shots on the perimeter, crash the boards and make every sort of possession count. Yeah, and, you know, Mick Cronin tying in his Cincinnati and Dodgers roots or his Los Angeles roots right there as he came from the Bearcats to the Bruins. Man, there's three guys I really like on this team, and then everyone else is just kind of hit or miss. Burke, believe it or not, is actually my favorite player to watch the team. I think he's got the highest chance of legitimately making an NBA roster. Six foot nine, 245 pounds, hefty lefty, you know, nice point forward type of guy. 
He's just got a sweet stroke for his size, man. And, you know, you see it when it's in Pac-12 play. Oregon against Stanford, you know, he's averaging double-digit points, 12 and a half points a game over the last two. And that's unlimited shot attempts. I was listening to the Oregon broadcast, and Mick Cronin was talking to, you know, uh, the, the, the broadcast team that was out there for CBS and basically was saying, Burke, we need you to shoot the ball more, buddy. Like, you're one of our best offensive weapons. You got to be aggressive out there. And I get it, man. He's a young kid. He's from Turkey. He's a true freshman. He's probably just learning the American lingo out there. But there's flashes there where if this guy stays another year and harnesses his ability, this guy has the ceiling level to be the best player in the pack or the Big Ten moving forward. I totally believe that. I think Burke is very, very talented. Needs to get more confidence in the shot. Needs to kind of get the offense more in his favor, but he's got all the tools in the tool chest that you would want to see from a true freshman moving forward. Number two, Adam Bona. I mean, if this guy was in 2001, 2002, this guy'd be a lottery pick in the NBA, you know, defense rebounding, you know, alley-oop finisher at the rim. We kind of talked about it in the game that we were there. You know, he just has that rim runner, your Clint Capella's, your Tyson Chandler's, you know, he's got that kind of thing going for him. Would have liked to have seen him kind of develop a little bit more, of a shot, you know, or, you know, some handles in the off season. He's pretty much the same, you know, rebounder, always a threat to get a double, double out there on the floor, which is great. We love that. And Bona, Bona is a solid, very solid center at the college level. I think that's what his game is right now. I don't know if you can elevate past that, but he's definitely a guy you want on your team. And then third is Sebastian Mack. Like you mentioned, he's kind of the go-to it guy when you can't generate offense. This team has, lacked generating offense mightily this year. I think that's been the Achilles heel of this team thus far. Mac has an ability to get to the basket, draw free throws, get you guys out of bad stretches, hit some tough shots. McClendon has moments too. He's been really the only reliable three-point shooter. But Mac, I mean, if you need a bucket right now, that's the guy UCLA has been targeting and going to. And I think that's great. Two guys I need to step up, Dylan Andrews, Last two games has scored in single digits for UCLA. We need him to kind of get things rolling. And Lazar Stefanovic, I mean, we thought this guy was going to be the, you know, the the downtown three-point shooter that was going to really take UCLA to the next level. Stefanovic just has not been there early. It's a confidence issue right now. Maybe he shoots his way out of this slump. But, man, in order for UCLA to maybe have a shot at the tournament, Stefanovic, I think, is the key. Because you're shooting 29%, like you mentioned. That's 301st madman in college basketball out of 354 teams. That is not great, frankly, in any metric. I don't think the, the facilitator, you know, having that offense run through one very strong, decisive guard like Tiger is fixable. The shooting is fixable, though. So if you can get the shooting right, maybe you can shoot your way into some games where, you know, maybe you can contend with a team like Arizona. Maybe you can contend with the teams in the top of the conference if you're shooting the ball well. But those are the three guys that I've seen that have really stood out to me. And Andrews and Stefanovic really need to step up. I think those are fair arguments for this point. No, I, I totally agree with you, Will. And and kind of starting at, at the top there, I, I, I love your assessment of Burke because he's probably the most skilled offensive player UCLA has today right now. When yeah. you talk about his ability to post up, and he's got that sweet left hand. He's got that jump hook. He's kind of got that floater game in the post and just a really soft touch. He knows exactly what he wants to do in the post. He's very intentional. And then he can have counter moves off of that left hand, you know, kind of reverse spin, you know, pump fakes, all of that. I think one of the critiques that, that Mick has had of Burke is, you know, just play through the contact. Sometimes he sort of over dribbles and avoids contact to try and draw fouls. I think it's still kind of that European style that he wants to sort of completely transition from. But I totally agree with you. I think there's a world here where the second half of the season, Burke is going to be the leading scorer on this team. And I almost expect that to take place. So couldn't agree with you more. With Bona, you nailed it. Tyson Chandler was the name that came to mind for me as well. And, and you, you hit the nail on the head there. The one thing I'll say about Bona is, he is a very strong athlete in the open floor as well. And when you talk about kind of chase down blocks, getting back defensively, but he's also utilized that Euro step very beautifully in terms of semi-transition opportunities. I think the one area is, does he have a go-to move in the half court? And I think he's kind of still struggling to sort of figure it out. Guys with lower centers of gravity, kind of lower girth, are sort of bodying him up and kind of pushing him off you know, the block and further away. And I don't know if he's as confident a turnaround shooter. That's not really in his game. So I think if Bona can just sort of find a go-to move in the half court and sort of utilize that, 
that will do wonders moving forward. And then you nailed it with Mac. I mean, he's kind of the one guy who's able to sort of dissect his body and just throw his body into traffic, draw fouls, get into the paint, um, have some very clever and one plays and unique plays over the course of this season. But I think the shooting is the key here. Uh, thriller of, of whether this team can kind of make a run moving forward. Stefanovic, Andrews, McClendon, because here's the thing. When you can hit, you know, two or three threes from one of these guys on a consistent basis, what that does is it makes teams needing to honor the perimeter game. They're going to play up. And what does that do? That creates more space in the paint for the likes of a Burke and a Bona. And you can sort of generate ball movement not necessarily through a traditional point guard, but you can generate ball movement just through the spacing on the court. And you let your offense, the offensive structure, play the role of point guard. But when you can't hit shots consistently, everyone's just going to pack it in. It's just sort of a bar fight in there. Everything is clogged. Everything is just sort of painful uh, to, to be able to look through. So Stefanovic, Andrews, and McClendon, one of those three guys is going to really have to emerge offensively from a three-point standpoint Otherwise, this is going to be a struggle. Because at the end of the day, Will, this team still brings it every night defensively. All they need to do is hit a few more shots. And I think moving forward, they need to really think of these next six or seven weeks as development. Because I think the way UCLA has a shot to get into the tournament is winning the conference tournament. And I think right now, when you think about the Pac-12, it's sort of Arizona and everybody else. Arizona is the 10th ranked team in the country. And nobody else in the Pac-12 is ranked in the top 25. Colorado's threatening a little bit. Utah's threatening a little bit. USC with Isaiah Collier and all the decorated guys they had with Boogie Ellis, they've been a huge disappointment. So I think there's a world here where if UCLA can start playing the right way in the ball that they want to play, turnover-free, aggressive, hitting some timely jump shots at the right time, they can go into that Pac-12 tournament. And how many times, Will, have we seen a conference tournament favorite, either sort of look ahead to the NCAA tournament or maybe not bring their best effort in a conference tournament. And guess what? There's an automatic birth opportunity there. So the way I would think about this if I was Mick Cronin is I'm going to use the next 14, 15 conference games as a development opportunity to play my best ball in that conference tournament weekend because that's my best path to make an NCAA berth here this year. Yeah, and I mean, there is an opportunity for us to align if the shooting improves, so let's hope that's what the case is. And we talked about this before, man. To some extent, I don't agree with this. To some extent, I agree with the lack of NIL support to Chip because you guys just don't like him. You don't support him. Basketball, that's a whole different equation. Mick Cronin is one of the most beloved guys on campus. I know it's a down year for UCLA, but that's expected. When you're losing legends at UCLA like Jaime and Tiger, and even, you know, your Amari Bailey's, who was a NF NBA draft pick. These are guys that aren't really easy to replace. So give Mick some time. If you guys want to make a difference in NIL and get out there, donate to Men of Westwood. Get it going, guys. There's no excuse not to be donating to basketball. I get it somewhat to football. Get out there and donate to basketball. Madman, uh, this was a whole lot of fun, dude. I'm looking forward to doing a lot of N uh, NCAA basketball thoughts. Uh, give me your parting, uh, parting thoughts for this entire uh, podcast and radio segment for 1090. Well, well, obviously, so much fun, and and I love kind of where we're going now, where we get to talk football and basketball, all things UCLA. Look, I think from a football standpoint, I think more is coming here in the next couple of weeks and couple of months in terms of filling out this roster. And look, January fifteenth is a really big date here, Will, in terms of declaration for the NFL draft. The one guy I still have my eye on in terms of this hey, roster Mike. from a football standpoint is Sturdy, J. Mike. Yeah. And so if, if Sturdivant, you know, he's the one last kind of variable in terms of where he's going. If Sturdivant comes back, you're talking about Sturdivant, Kyle Ford, Flores on the outside. You got TJ Harden. Harden coming back. You got Ethan Garbers coming back. A lot of stability to really like. If you can fortify that line with two or three gets in the transfer portal, and then get a couple of more defensive linemen and edge rushers. This is a team that's going to be very solid in 2024. I know the narrative feels one way, but when you look at it building block by building block, this is going to be a solid group here in 24. So there's a lot to sort of be excited about in that regard. And then with basketball, look, this is a rebuilding year. Let's see if this team can make a run uh, going into conference tournament play. Let's not forget 
We talk a lot about last year and the year before when this team was loaded. The miracle run from first four to final four in 2021. UCLA lost four straight games that year going into the NCAA tournament. They were the last team in and just sort of limped in and then made an incredible run. That's what makes March so special. So UCLA now has an opportunity with the turn of the calendar year to sort of reset, reestablish themselves and see if they can make a run in the conference tournament. So a lot to be excited about here these next couple of months. And we're going to have it all for you, football and basketball, with my main man, Will the Thrill. So, so much fun here, Will, and, and can't wait for the next one. To quote my main man's favorite movie, so you're saying there's a chance. Yeah. <laughs> we, got, we got a chance for UCLA this year, guys. Make sure you're liking and subscribing to the podcast and tuning in to ESPN Radio 1090 The Mightier. We'll be back in a minute. Don't go anywhere. L.A. football on 